our final speaker is Janice Anderson. Janice is an affiliate professor in the Department of Art History at Concordia and a founding member of the Canadian Women Artists History Initiative. Recently retired from her position as visual arts curator or visual resources curator in the Faculty of Fine Arts at Concordia, she continues to pursue work at the initiative and her interest in Canadian feminism and women of the 19th century. And take it away, Janice. Thank you. In November 1838, at the Seigneury of Beauharnois in Lower Canada, not far from Montreal, 500 rebel patriots seeking the political, economic, and social reform of their relationships with Great Britain converged on the town of Beauharnois. Half were armed with rifles, the other half with converted tools. During a raid of the seigneury house in search of additional weapons, they took a number of prisoners, including the son of the seigneur, Edward Ellis, his wife, Catherine Jane Ellis, the topic of this paper, and her sister, Eglantine Balfour. Held captive for six days and then released, the family quickly left Canada and returned to their home in Scotland, far in advance of their original intention to remain until the following year, and they never returned. Catherine Jane Ellis's watercolor painting of the Patriots, shown here, has become the go-to internet source for images of the insurrection and is used by multiple websites, sometimes reversed and often uncredited. In her journal, Ellis described the men she painted as picturesque ruffians. For although she was certainly in fear for her life and the lives of her husband and her sister, Ellis betrayed little of her emotions in her writing the model of British upper-class strength and graciousness under siege. Catherine Jane Ellis, known throughout her life to her friends and family as Janie, was born to a wealthy family in Scotland in 1814. Shown here in a portrait miniature painted in 1841 by Sir Charles William Ross, Ellis lived the privileged life of a wealthy British woman. What is known about her today consists primarily of the journal that she kept during her travels to Canada and the United States from April until December 1838, and also in the 23 watercolor sketches that accompanied it. Additional insights can be gleaned from a book of household recipes and advice that she compiled several years after her return to Scotland, a second diary written prior to her Canadian travels, and a collection of additional watercolour images held in Scotland. The Ellis family came to Canada as part of the entourage of Lord Durham, who had been sent to settle the aftermath of rebellions that had taken place a year earlier in 1837. Edward Ellis, Catherine Jane Ellis's husband, and the son of the seigneur of Beauharnois, accompanied Lord Durham as private secretary, bringing with him his wife and her sister. They visited the 280,000 acre seigneury at Beauharnois from July to November of 1838. Catherine Jane Ellis's journal recording her travel experiences is an important piece of first-hand documentation of the 1838 rebellion. But as a self-portrait, it reveals, as all journals must, only a fraction of the author's biography. The journal itself was not intended to be a private document for the author alone. The book in which it was recorded had been given to Ellis by her father-in-law with the inscription, to be kept faithfully and fully on her American expedition by Janie for her affectionate Edward Ellis. The text, therefore, was for the benefit of someone other than herself and reads as much like a documentary travelogue as a recording of Ellis's personal thoughts. Her images, on the other hand, are perhaps more susceptible to interpretation. In this painting, which hangs in the show that this conference accompanies, we see a most unusual construction of space. 
The title tells us that it is a self-portrait, the artist and her cabin companion, her sister, as reflected in a mirror hanging on the door of their cabin in the Hastings, the ship that brought them from England to Canada. The painting is difficult to read and has an unusual internal structure, quite unlike that of any other artwork that comes readily to mind. On the left-hand side of, are the cabin and its window. On the right is a mirror on the door with the artist's reflection portrayed from her position in her bunk in front of her companion. Ellis's unusual choice of framing can be read as an initial representation of the disjuncture that I speculate that this young woman, only 24 years old when she left England, would have felt at leaving her homeland and traveling for a month across the Atlantic Ocean, unsure of her safety at sea, seasick certainly, bored, cramped, and possibly frightened, although, she, again, she does not betray this to any great extent in her journal. Here, the mirror cannot function as a foil for the viewer to admire the artist's beauty, the stereotype of a woman portrayed in a mirror. Although she is facing her reflection, Ellis does not reveal her facial features, choosing instead an essentially blank shape to represent her face, her features, and those of her sister, mere suggestions. Although the title tells us that the image is a self-portrait, without it, the figures are unidentifiable, generic. Ellis subverts the stereotypical conceit of the representation of a woman, either by their own hand as a self-portrait or by the hand of another artist, male or female. The typical vacuous representation of beauty, as presented for the viewer presumed to be male, is subverted by Ellis's decision to leave her face featureless. She accomplishes, she accomplishes two things then in this painting. First, she compresses and complexifies the space, evoking for the viewer the unsettling experience of traveling in the ship and facing an unknown future. Second, we might also argue that she leaves an ambiguous representation of herself. And it is this ambiguous self, this absent self-portrait, to use Francis Borzello's words, that I would like to explore further. I will suggest then that Ellis's unusual, slightly awkward representations of compressed and inaccessible interiors exist in a liminal space that proposes a potential reading on the borderline between her privileged imperialist state of mind along uh, of, of mind and confidence in her own position in the colonial structure juxtaposed against the lived experience of an unfamiliar and sometimes threatening environment, which was a displaced reality that her social position could not allow her to express in writing. In her journal, Ellis makes frequent references to time spent sketching. Here we are looking at her rendition of the scenery at Beauharnois. Like many wealthy women of her day, Ellis was versed in sketching and painting. Considered a suitable pastime for elite young ladies, the activity filled many hours of the day. Ellis was a proficient painter and, I would argue, an outstanding colorist. Her watercolor version of the area surrounding her father-in-law's property demonstrates that she had control of all the elements of the painting of small-scale landscapes. It's a lovely rendition with each element convincingly recorded. The mood is tranquil the sky storm free, the water calm, and nothing blocks the viewer's right of entry. Anyone could step easily into the accessible scene and stroll to the waterfront. In other words, Ellis created this and numerous other images that consist exactly of what one, what one would expect of a watercolor landscape by a talented amateur artist from a wealthy family of the time. For me, the important factor about these images is the viewer's ability to enter them and to move freely around the space. In this way, then, they function in contradistinction to Ellis's images of interior spaces, which she seemed to experience and express differently. The ability to enter and metaphorically walk through Ellis's landscape paintings, then, makes her representations of the interior of the Seigneury House at Beauharnois more intriguing. 
There are many things to consider about this image of the drawing room, for example, and borrowing from the writings of the, in feminist geography of Lynn Staheli and Patricia Martin, I will concern myself with the quote, the spatial organization of phenomena, the processes that organize the word, world spatially, and the implications of the spatial organization for particular issues and people. We see three figures. The full figure of the woman, likely Ellis's sister Eglantine, in the foreground, the head of the man at the piano in the background, and the legs only of the man seated to the left in the far room. The placement of the figures seems awkward in the first place. Why have two of the seats been moved to locations beside and facing the doorway? Perhaps the occupants were simply trying to enjoy the piano music, but then why not occupy the same room? But there are additional features that make the image strangely staged and disjointed. The door, for example, could not successfully close to its opening. Objects in the room, the birdcage on the window ledge, the flowers on the coffee table, the objects on the table beside the reader seem unstable, and in the far room, the furniture placed to the right is so crowded together that the use of the couch corner would not be possible unless one sat sideways. The interior is also slightly messy. The artist, then, is suggesting a snapshot view, a view of her reality, rather than a posed scene. So what are the implications? If we read the artist into the framing of her interior, I would like to suggest that Ellis was unable to produce a resolved version of herself in a Quebec interior, a version that we could metaphorically walk through, because she was always already, and she defined herself as being, not from here. We can read this additionally in her journal, at points where she reiterates her superior opinion of herself and her heritage, in her criticisms a mocking of local people, their clothes, manners, and customs. Although I do not wish to emphasize this criticism as the primary trait of her character, I believe it was reiterated by her in order to define as other, meaning inferior, the people around her, and to maintain her identity as a British subject in what she saw as a rather backward colony. When she painted this scene, Ellis knew already that there might well be some future trouble, some possible violence at the seigneury. She had heard the rumors and rumblings of discontent, and although in her position as the wife of a wealthy man of the time, she did not overly concern herself with political questions, or at least did not express her concern in her journal, nevertheless, she must have felt the anxiety of possible upheaval. The disjuncture of the surroundings foreshadows the trouble that was to come. And when trouble did arrive in the form of the Patriots storming the house and taking its occupants captive, the trouble was serious. In her journal, Ellis wrote, quote, in five minutes, a brisk firing commenced all around the cottage, bullets coming through the houses in all directions. Then came a dreadful rush of men, women, and children screaming, some falling and being trampled in the doorway. We thought the rebels were coming to murder us. Perhaps the disjuncture in the formation of interior space is even clearer in this image of the drawing room, front hall, and door of the house at Beauharnois. The view to the outside through the door depicts a fragment of a conventional, easily readable landscape, again an accessible space. Yet inside the, house is fur the inside the house, the furniture is placed so oddly that a study of the image leaves numerous questions. What stands it directly in front of the entranceway? Perhaps the chair with a coat or shawl and hat thrown over it is holding open the door, but why is another chair placed facing the door? Even the door itself seems unlikely, composed as it is in the painting of panes of glass only. It is certainly conceivable that the doorway had French doors and that we simply cannot see the second door, but if not, then the door as depicted could not have closed off the space. If we, went, if we venture into the drawing room where the two figures are placed, we see an odd arrangement of a small sofa and a table. The table is placed directly in front of the sofa, denying access and making the furniture all but unusable. An armchair is squashed beside the table, adding a sense of unreadability to the scene. 
The person seated to the left, we see only legs, arms, and a held book, is also misplaced. The seat holding him much lower than the seat of the sofa, and the table beside him looming. In total, the space created is not a usable space, a space of comfort or easy access, but is instead, like Ellis's other interiors, a compressed, partially inaccessible, and conflicted rendering. Additional insight into the person Catherine Jane Ellis can be found in a volume of recipes and household advice that she created following her return to England, a volume that is distinctly different in content and tone from the American Journal. So we're, just, we're looking at the, uh, the cover of the publication and on, on the right, two, two excerpted pages. The book includes a number of humorous entries and illustrations, such as advice on how to get rid of rats, and, and I'll do my best Scottish accent for you. Recipe for banishing rats. <laughs> get a big Heelander with his bag of pipe. He blows music, all the rats run away. <laughs> Or, to recover venison, though it smell not to be endured, a method of saving rotting meat, illustrated by two cherubs with noses buried in a large handkerchief, and a cook with her nose buried in her apron. Janie Ellis, then, was a woman with a sense of humor, a characteristic that stands out in this collection of recipes and advice, but which was not revealed in her Canadian journal. And if we examine the representation of interior space at the bottom of this piece, so you're looking on your left at an exerted page, and then on the right a detail of the image at the bottom of the page. If we examine the representation of interior space at the bottom of this piece of information on how to fix chalk or charcoal drawings from the same book of recipes and advice, we find a different interior space from the spaces that characterized Beauharnois. Here is a room that we can traverse freely without the encumbrance of the compression of space, the instability of objects, or the odd placement of spatial components. In the small drawing, in other words, the two components that define the Canadian sketches, that is, the disjuncture between Ellis's class position and her vulnerability facing the coming insurrection, are resolved. This work is the representation of a woman in possession of her own space, confident in her right to move freely around and through it. The furniture, people, and objects in the room sit firmly on their surfaces. The colonial experience of disjuncture is over. We no longer read the imperialist self in the representation of the space that she occupies. And for Catherine Jane Ellis, artist, writist, writer, humorist, things have returned to her own experience of normal. Finally, I would like to express my thanks to the artist herself, or at least to her ghost. I'm sure she could not possibly have imagined an art historian of the 21st century poring over her paintings and making judgments and observations. I would like to tell her how much I enjoyed learning about her, about the history that surrounded her experiences, and more about the history of Canada and of Quebec. But most of all, I would like to tell her how lovely I found her watercolors how much they told of that history, and how moved I have been by their delicate use of a, col a color palette that has so succinctly captured the mood of the spaces she was representing. Thank you.